All right. Good afternoon to everyone on the line. Uh, welcome to today's session on ergonomics in the home presented by IPAR Rehab uh, in partnership with NT WorkSafe as part of National Safe Work Month. Um, IPAR is a national occupational rehab provider uh, who provide client-centered services to support people to remain at work, uh, to return to work, and to find new employment. In the NT, IPAR provides occupational rehab services in the same employer and different employer streams through the WorkSafe NT scheme, ComCare, life insurance, as well as one-off services, including, of course, ergonomic assessments. Uh, today, we have Tamsin Hearn, our IPAR, IPAR NT area manager, and Josh Adams, one of our ergonomics subject matter experts presenting. My name's Stuart, and I'll be the moderator for today. Um, what we want out of today's session, it's a nice interactive session, so if you've got questions along the way, please feel free to type them into the questions tab. You'll see that on your right-hand side, uh, so jump in at any time add a question and we'll try and get to those as soon as we can. Um, but yeah, we're, um, we're having a look at ergonomics in the home. What we know about ergonomics in the home, um, what are some of the challenges you've had whilst working in this home setting? Uh, obviously, for those in the NT, you guys have been had a little bit more freedom to return back to the office um, than, say, the people down in Victoria. But um, you may find yourself working in a home setting it from time to time and, and it's going to be really important that you set yourself up as well as you can. Um, so we'll give you some feedback on how to set up your equipment and your workspace um, and what you can do for yourself to try and manage through the, the working from home challenges. We'll also be having a look at the broader work environment and how you might set that up as well. So what's this all about? It's all about being as proactive as possible. Um, we want people to try and review and develop good habits um, straight off the bat when you go to a working from home arrangement rather than letting letting yourself slip into those poorer habits um, and having things develop into bigger issues than they need to be. Need to be. Uh, first and foremost, it's about reviewing the current workspace that you're in, um, having to think about things that you might have had access to in the office and, and things that, you've, um, that you might have done in the past that may have resulted in discomfort, uh, reviewing those behaviours, the workplace setup, the equipment that you've got, um, and trying to make some change now. Um, and the most important thing that we find with, with ergonomics is it's about your own behaviours within the workspace. So you may have access to some really good equipment. You might not. You may have a dedicated workspace. You might be working in the kitchen or in the lounge room. Um, all of those things are second to your workplace behaviours and what you do within the workspace. Because ergonomics isn't just about uh, the equipment that you use, but it's also about your behaviours the work tasks that you do uh, and how you interact with all three of those different elements. Now, why is this important? Uh, what we know about ergonomics uh, and about injury prevention in general is that the earlier you can get to it, the better um, or the more likely you are to have a positive outcome. So we're trying to capture you at the left-hand side of this scale here uh, where you're still not having too much discomfort or any aches or pains or anything like that. Um, if we can capture you down there and keep you down there, you're more, more likely to leave work each day happy and healthy and, and able to do the things that you want to do. Um, if we can get your workplace set up well um, and get you engaged in this sort of process, what we also know is that your productivity and your well-being uh, can be improved or increased. And you're also a much lesser risk of developing discomfort, pain, and potentially injury. All right, enough from me. Uh, so what we're going to do, we're going to start off with a bit of an open panel discussion. So with Josh and Tamsin on the line there, um, I'll bring them up in a sec. But the first question I put to you, Josh and Tamsin, is how are you maintaining some structure and normality into your workday when you're working from home? Uh, and what are some of the biggest challenges that you've faced? 
Yeah, so um, happy to start off there. So I think it's firstly really important to recognise that working from home does present new challenges in terms of maintaining good mental and physical health and maintaining some sort of structure and routine in your day is really, really important to make sure that you're not falling into bad habits. So um, I've been really lucky that I haven't had a long period working from home, but when I did need to work from home, um, I found it really hard to um, switch on at the start of the day and also switch off at the end of the day. So something that I introduced into my structure was to make sure that I had a specific dedicated workspace that I would go to to do my work. So that way when I entered that space, I would associate that with with work and switching on and productivity and focus. And even more importantly, I suppose, leaving that space at the end of the day, making sure I then dissociate from work and go back into my um, different space of, of R&R, essentially. So establishing structure at the start and the end of my day and clear boundaries between where my workspace was and where my my home and, and relaxation space was. Because it can be really easy for that line to become quite blurred, can't it? If you, you find that you're getting up out of bed straight into work and then end of the day, you're in the space that you've been all day and that's where you're trying to switch off. Absolutely. And, you know, in terms of maintaining work-life balance, if you don't have clear boundaries between those two different things and that line is blurred, then you're not, you're not differentiating between work and life. It's, it's all blurred together. So you need to be um, really sure to, to put structure in your day to make sure that you're doing that. And that can also be things like um, making sure at the start of the day you put your alarm on you get up at the same time you would as if you were heading into the office and you get up, you get dressed into your work clothes or at least get out of your pyjamas um, and then you go into that workspace. Yeah, definitely important, especially when we're spending a lot of time in front of um, in front of the camera and a lot of time doing Zoom meetings and things like this. Um, so trying to maintain that level of professionalism even when you are working in the home uh, home setting as well. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, touched on a few of those. Um, assign yourself a dedicated workspace. Try to maintain some structure, some routine, and a work-life balance. Um, things like setting your alarm, uh, packing down at the end of the day, all really important in providing that level of distinction between what is the workspace and what is your home environment so that you can actually relax and switch off as well. Absolutely. And I'll just jump in and just, I know, obviously, being in Melbourne, motivation's obviously been quite a challenge as well so for me um you know having a really clear structure does has helped me in terms of overcoming that barrier as well in terms of motivation and making sure that i'm trying to stick to the same sort of routine that i had um, or as i would have um, during my normal work day and trying to fill those gaps that i might spend say driving into the office, um, spending that time doing something productive for myself um, to sort of help me um, in terms of that motivation side of things as well. So, yeah, um, it's definitely been a challenge, but um, a challenge for a lot of people. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right, next question. How have you guys... Uh, said about managing your time, particularly around other people in your households? Open this up to either of you. Um, I'll, I'm happy to start off with this one, but um, I know for myself, my partner um, is also working from home. So we actually only have the one office space here. So for those days, my partner only works um, three days a week. So for those days where... I guess we're both working. Um, we've been able to sort of split split those days a little bit. So I might spend half the day in the office environment um, while um, my partner's out um, at the kitchen table um, working from that area um, and then we sort of swap over halfway. So there's a bit of evenness to that and I guess it allows us both to, to be nice and comfortable during the day. Um, when it comes to... I guess working, I guess we've tried to set up our office sort of area in an area of the house, which is 
free from a lot of distractions. So it's in the room that's furthest away from, um, I guess, the front of the house, which obviously backs onto the street. So it gets us away from any noise um, that may be coming through um, from from trucks or, or things that are passing. So makes for a nice quiet environment as well, which has really helped. Sorry, dropped out for a second. <laughs> um, so, yeah, plan around your work and family schedule. Um, if you're having troubles with noise, try to try not to work through it too much. Um, try to take a break, stretch, reset. Uh, and if, if you do have disturbances and things like that, then seek support from the people in the house um, or from outside sources about how you might minimise those disruptions as well. I guess it comes back to your level of communication with others in the house. And, um, yeah, I suppose I, you know, again, I was really lucky in that that wasn't a barrier for, for myself. When I was working from home, I was the only person there. So I suppose I was free from, from noise and other people's schedules, but it became really important for me to then um, make sure that I was being really diligent in still scheduling in things like breaks and time away from my workstation because I didn't have anyone there to remind me to do those things. So when you're at work or working with someone else, you know, you go and grab a cup of coffee or you have your morning tea, you sit down for lunch and you take that time away from your workstation and share that with other people. If you're working from home um, and you don't have anyone else there, there's no one to encourage you to take those breaks and, and you really need those those mental breaks from your workspace. So I found that I had to actually at the start of my day plan when I was going to take my breaks and put them in my calendar so I would receive a notification from my calendar telling me to go and have my tea break or go and get coffee or switch off at the end of the day. So making sure that I was following regular um, scheduled breaks. And there's, um, there's some really good apps and things out there that you can use for those reminder systems. I think if you just type into the the Apple store, into the Android store, um, work breaks or work break reminders, then it'll come up with a whole range of different phone apps that you can use for those that sort of thing as well. Um, I know there's some software that you can install onto your computer that will actually lock you out of your your computer from time to time if, you, if it does pick up that you've been working for hours on end. <laughs> um, so whether you want to go to that sort of extreme um, or not is is entirely up to you, but there is options for that. Um, if you're finding that you, you do find it difficult to just stop, take a break and reset from time to time. Absolutely. All right. What are some of your tips for maintaining a work-life balance and why is this so important? So um, I suppose this sort of links into what I was saying before and the importance of having a separate, a separate station or a separate area for you to do your work. Um, if that, that dedicated work area is, for example, your dining room table, then that's fine. But the, to then go and eat your dinner next to your workstation, you're not able to fully separate yourself from your work and switch off. So to pack away your work stuff, put away your phone, put away your laptop and get rid of your workstation at the end of the day so you can then go into that space and have your dinner and fully relax and not think about it um, is, again, making sure there's a clear a clear boundary and a clear line. Um, so, yeah, make sure you, you pack down your workstation at the end of the day and then reset it back up at the start of the day. Don't mix your, your leisure and your work in the same areas. Absolutely. Oh, sorry, go, Josh. No, I was just going to say, and we spoke about it before in terms of, um, I guess, when we're in that office environment, it's really easy to, you know, simply jump up, ask some a question and, and have those incidental breaks throughout the workday. Whereas when we're working from home, I know for myself initially, um, you tend to get stuck into things and because there aren't those I wouldn't call them distractions. I'd call them more opportunities um, to get up and, and interact during the day. Um, you find yourself sitting there for longer periods. So, yeah, I guess in order to maintain that work-life balance, scheduling in those breaks and really trying to stick to them is important. And like I said, something I've tried to do is that travel time that I would usually spend to and from the office, 
implementing like a walk in the morning or a, a bit of a walk in the evening um, to just add that balance back into my day um, has, yeah, is really helpful and um, is something that's really important, especially during these times um, where I guess, um, yeah, those opportunities to interact with other people and and I guess the mental health side of things has been challenging for a lot of people. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think you've touched on it there, but physical activity, the benefits of that can't be overstated and, and we'll talk about that a little bit later about what you might be able to do day to day. Uh, we've had a question from Peter. He said, Hi, Stuart, a friend in Melbourne who has been working from home since February has said that even though he has made those clear distinctions between work and home, everything has become a blur and he's had to ask for leave. Is that the only option when things are a blur, taking leave? Question mark. It's a good question. I think, uh, like, at the moment, given the current scenario, um, I know our own business, IPA, we've been encouraged to take leave um, to help us in terms of managing just how we're tracking and it's important to have those days um, to ourselves. Um, yeah, I guess it, it, it has become very difficult um, in terms of though the lines between work and home crossing. So, yeah, I can see the, the issues um, that, I guess your friend Peter is having, but at the same time, I don't think leave um, in itself is a particularly bad thing. I think, you know, we all need to have those periods to, to switch off and refresh and get back into things. I think, well, it's it's really easy when, um, if you are, for example, if you're working from home, if you're relaxing at home, if you're doing absolutely everything from home, then again, you're, you're getting in a, a bad habit and, and you're getting a little bit lost in the same space all the time. So even though you can't leave to go to the office or a cafe or the shops, making sure that you leave that space and you leave your house once a day is so important to sort of reset. So even if it's literally going for a 30 minute walk at the end of the day to get out of that same space, um, once you finish work and come back and know that then that's your free time, that's something that can sort of help um, establish, get rid of that blur um, is, is get out of the space before then going back into the space um, to, to do something else. So that's something else that you can think about. Yeah, absolutely. And I guess the other thing that's important to do is, is speak to your employer. Um, if you're finding that the distinction between what is your your work time and what is your home time is becoming really blurred um, and you're not able to keep that distinction there anymore, then there might be something available to you from your employer's point of view that you can do to, to make some change, whether that's delegating some tasks elsewhere or whether they have some support services that you can speak to, um, such as EAP, uh, they might be able to provide some assistance there so that if you, you're not wanting to take take some leave and take some time to refresh. Um, maybe there's some other support services available to you. So, yeah, speak to speak to HR or speak to your employer and, and that's always a good starting point as well. Um, I think down in Melbourne, obviously, there's the added challenge of everyone being locked down to, well, now it's, it's 25 kilometres, but having been locked down to a very small space. Um, but, yeah, there's definitely lots you can do within lots of green spaces you can get out to, spend a bit of time outside of the house and um, away from the people that you're seeing each and every day and just have a little bit of time to yourself to, to reset and that, that might be enough to get you through. We've also got another question from Vaso who asks, can you recommend an app or a program, free preferably, that reminds me to take a break each and every hour and suggest some stretches and strength activities? I have actually found a really useful one called Focus Keeper that you can download onto your phone. Um, it gives you a reminder each half an hour, and I think you can tweak the settings a little bit um, to suit your needs. Uh, and that every half hour it gives a little reminder to get up on your feet, reset, and then come back into your work task. Um, in terms of stretching and strengthening, we will um, we'll go run through a little stretching and strengthening program towards the end of the session. Uh, so if you can hold on to them, then we'll uh, we'll give you some ideas there and we'll, we might talk around a few apps as well. All right, last question for you too. I think we covered most of those. 
what are some things that you might need to, what are some other things that you might need to consider when working from home? I think um, it, something important to remember when you're working from home is that you have control over the area that you work in. So make sure you enjoy being in the space that you've set up to work in. Make sure that you feel calm um, and that you're not surrounded by clutter and, you know, you've not got your washing sitting there that's going to distract you. You know, you can make sure that the space that you're working in is something that that helps you focus. So making sure that it's, like I said, free from clutter, free from distractions, free from things that are going to um, distract you from your work. Um, and that also leads into, um, you know, making sure that there's no trip hazards around, things like that. So if you've got your washing right behind your desk, um, you might forget it's there and trip over it. So making sure that it's a safe workspace as well as clutter-free and, and calming. Awesome. And I guess the other thing that I'm sure we'll move into um, very, very soon is um, there's lots of things around the house that we can use to our advantage in terms of helping with our setup. Um, of our workstations as well and you'll see that um, or you'll see those suggestions come through as we move into the next part of the presentation which looks at our our actual setup and and things we can do there to make us feel nice and and comfortable and relaxed so absolutely um, and I guess the last thing we haven't touched on uh, but also very important is actually checking your workspace and making sure that you're free of clutter and hazards as well um, it can be all too easy when you are working in the home environment to forget about some of those things. You've got kids running around, um, you've got pets potentially, you've got household items that you're not used to in an office space. Um, it can all become very easily become a tripping hazard or something like that. Um, the need to check your electrical items and make sure that they're all uh, up to scratch as well um, to make sure that the workspace is up to the, the level of safety that would be expected of when you're working in the office as well. All right, next section of the presentation today is actually looking at some of the specific equipment that you're using. So, Josh, do you want to take us through, or Tamsin, do you want to take us through who's um, how to set up your desk itself? Yeah, so first, just a side note, I'm sure everyone's had some sort of ergonomic assessment before, but the reason why it's so important to go over all of this equipment side of things is that we need to ensure that our ergonomic setup at home is actually allowing us to maintain good posture throughout the day. So good posture essentially means that um, all of your joints are aligned and in a nice relaxed neutral position and there's no extra stress or strain going through any part of your body that's going to create tension or overuse injuries or anything like that. So that's why this is so important. Um, a good place to start is to look at your desk. So um, first thing to have a think about is whether your desk is adjustable. And I know um, that if you're working from home, it's, it's going to be more likely that your desk is not adjustable, um, whether you're working from a dining room table, from a breakfast bar, or whether you're lucky enough to actually have a desk, um, check whether it's adjustable. But if it's not, that's fine because we can adjust all of your other workstation elements to suit the height of the desk. Um, how to determine whether the desk is at the right height? That is the most important question. So when you're assessing the height of the desk, you need to pay special attention to your elbows. So um, when your desk is at the correct height, your elbows should make essentially a nice 90 degree angle. Um, so we want to make sure that our shoulders are nice and relaxed and that our arms are at 90 degrees, which basically is the um, best position of our elbows that causes the less stress in that area. So if my desk is too high, my shoulders are going to be raised and my arm is going to be at a smaller angle and that's going to put more load through my elbow. So making sure your elbows stay at a nice 90 degree angle. To achieve that, if you can't adjust your desk, you may need to adjust your chair. Josh. <laughs> Joshy, do you want to uh, take us through what we can do to adjust the chair if we can't adjust the, the desk itself? Absolutely. Um, in terms of the chair, I know at the moment um, 
we don't have all all have access to the lovely chair on the left hand side there um, which we would generally have um, as part of um, being in the office uh, most of us are working with the two to the right hand side of that so um, it's good and bad um, obviously it's important to remember in terms of chairs that no chair is going to be perfect. No chair is going to solve all of our problems, um, regardless um, of if we're, we've got a, a perfect ergonomic chair or, or just a general sort of dining chair. If we're spending long periods of time sitting in that chair without getting out of that chair, um, we're probably going to get uncomfortable. So um, there's a few things. I'll get Stu moved in the next slide that we can do in the meantime if you are, say, working from a dining chair or something similar. So you can see uh, the left-hand side there, there's a, a nice uh, picture of Stu um, in um, his kitchen area there, uh, kitchen, kitchen chair there, and you can see he's tied a bit of a towel to the back of the chair. It looks like we've lost you again. Um, and um, he's using that to provide a bit of some extra support through the lower back. Um, you can see in the middle photo there, well, you can sort of see it. It's sort of very, it's very dark, but um, the second photo there, there's actually a lumbar support pillow that um, the person is using there to provide some additional support through the lower back. Um, and then the other alternative is things like you can use a pillow. For example, for me, I haven't got access to an ergonomic chair, but I've got just, this is just a towel that I've rolled up um, to provide some extra support through my lower back in my chair. Um, I guess what we're wanting to achieve if we don't have an ergonomic chair at home is mainly a bit more cushioning on the, on the seat pan. Um, and some support through that lower back and making sure we've got that there when we're sitting back into the chair. Um, so some simple solutions there is to adding a bit more support to, um, I guess, that chair that you're working with at the moment if you are working from home. Um, generally, in terms of when we're setting up our chair, we want to have our hips towards the back of the seat um, so that we can maintain contact with the backrest um, for most of our day. I guess it's okay to spend periods of time, say, leaning forward or, you know, leaning onto one of your armrests or whatever it might be. The main thing with postures and things when we're working is just that we're not spending long periods of time in those postures and that that we're, we're moving out of them. Um, we want our feet to obviously be firm and flat on the floor. So in the scenario which Tamsin has obviously outlined where your desk might not be adjustable and we need to bring the chair up what that might mean is that we we need something under our feet um, so again household items um, like a, a shoe box um, a, a bucket something that's sturdy that you can pop under your feet is a really good solution to assist with providing some support under the feet if you can't quite reach the floor um, we want our knees bent at about 90 degrees, um, thighs parallel to the ground. Um, shoulders should be nice and relaxed as we've talked about with our elbows slightly above the, um, the, the desk so we can float across our keyboard and mouse. Um, and then in terms of the lumbar support, we want that obviously positioned in that natural curve of our lower back. So like we saw in those diagrams on the previous slides, um, a pillow, small towel, lumbar support cushion, if you have something like that around the house, um, can provide some of that additional support you might need um, if you don't have um, an ergonomic task chair at home. Great. So refreshing on that, we want feet firmly on the ground. Uh, knees and hips at 90 degrees and elbow resting just above the surface of the desk. Cool. All right. What about a standing workstation? Has anybody been creative in setting up one of these? Well, I think the, the picture there with the, the ironing boards set up is a, a brilliant um, demonstration of the things we can use around the house. Um, obviously, you know, everyone's aware of sit-to-stand desks in the office and there's no reason why you can't make yourself a handy sit-to-stand desk or standing desk from your home. So I think this 
this can be particularly um, important and useful for those people who potentially do not have an ergonomic chair at home. If you're sitting on something like a bar stool, um, setting up a standing work area like this ironing board example in the pictures um, can be a much better option. So um, uh, same principles apply when you're standing at your desk. You need your elbows to be 90 degrees. Um, so raising up your keyboard with some boxes and paper, some textbooks, whatever it is you need to get them to the right height um, and propping your, your monitor or your laptop on something to raise the screen height as well. You can use so many different things around the house. Um, and I think it's it's worth noting as well that um, if you can have a seated workstation set up and a standing workstation set up or one where you can alternate between the two of them, that is going to be ideal. So one where you can regularly swap from sitting to standing or move from your sitting workstation over to your standing ironing board workstation, um, that's going to be the most ideal. I think something else that we probably see quite a bit is people getting a standing workstation in the office or at home and then spending eight hours a day on their feet, uh, yeah. which isn't what the sit to stand workstation is designed for. It's designed to help you alternate as much as possible so that you're getting as much variation in your posture rather than just maintaining a static standing position or a static sitting position throughout the day. Absolutely. So you can use them to encourage you to change your posture regularly. Um, in terms of how, how frequently you should be doing that, um, ideally if you can swap every 30 minutes, that's that's the best and, and use that swapping time to encourage yourself or build a routine of, um, you know, sit for your half an hour, stand up, do a quick stretch, move over to your standing desk for half an hour, do a quick stretch, sit back down um, and get into a nice routine that way. Yeah, perfect. All right, a few more bits of equipment to touch on and then we'll jump into um, some Q&A for the last sort of 10 minutes or so. So a uh, quick little point there that Tamsin's touched on is every 30 minutes or so we're trying to stand up, stretch, adjust your position. Um, if you've got the, the benefit of the sit and stand desk, you can then stay standing for half an hour or so. Uh, but a, a nice quick break on your feet and moving around is all you need at that point. Joshy, what about our screens? How should we set these up? Yeah, so um, I'll go through these and we'll have some examples on the next slide um, for, of the working from home scenario. But in terms of height of your screens, um, ideally we want our eye line to fall within the top third of the screen. So sort of this area here, um, if you split your screen into three thirds vertically. Um, I guess what we want to do, if, that's, if you're currently in a position where um, that's not where your eye line is falling, adding, you know, some books, um, reams of paper, things around the house um, underneath the screen or your laptop or your monitors, whatever it is you're using to bring it up a little bit higher is a, a nice simple fix for that. Um, if you're working from a laptop, um, obviously that means that in order to access the keyboard and the mouse pad, you would most likely be in a bit of a not ideal position with your arms and shoulders sort of hunched. So ideally what we recommend in that scenario is um, having your separate keyboard and mouse um, so you can position your screen appropriately, but then um, keep that relaxed position through the shoulders and arms. Um, Ideally, we want our screen about an arm's distance away and, and that's obviously going to change for people depending on, say, the, the size of their screens and things like that. But ideally, an arm's distance is the way to go. There's other things we can change on the monitor to make visibility a bit easier. Um, so about an arm's distance. Um, and then in terms of positioning of our monitor, obviously, if we're using one directly in front of us, um, if, say, we're using one monitor and a laptop, we've got them both up at the height we want them to, but we're using our monitor, say, 70% of the day or more, and then our laptop just to refer across to for the remaining 30% of the day, having that main monitor in front of us with the laptop offset to the side is probably how you want to position. If you're using 
say say that set up and you're using both screens fairly evenly having them both on sort of a bit of an angle a slight angle with you centered to the middle borders of those two screens is the way to go um, that way you can it's just a small head turn when moving between the two screens yeah perfect. and again there's some nice creative solutions that you can use to prop up the monitor um, so you've got some textbooks there i'm sure everyone's got a few of those lying around um, an old plastic tub something like that anything that gets that um, the top of the screen equal to your eye line do you need a footrest so when we talked about the um the chair and the desk positioning before if you found that you needed to raise your chair height um, so that your elbow is sitting above the desk height uh, then you might find that you actually need something underneath your feet so that you're still maintaining firm contact there. So um, what you want to do is find something nice and solid. You don't want to be uh, putting something too soft under there because you're not going to get the level of support that you need. Um, but again, it's just about giving a bit of support under your feet so that your hips and your knees remain at about 90 degrees um, so that your lower limbs are supported, taking away a bit of strain from your lower back. Tamsin, do you want to take us quickly through where we should have everything positioned on our desk? Absolutely. So I think the most important thing to remember in this um, with your equipment setup is to make sure that your essential items or the items that you use all of the time are positioned directly in front of you and are nice and close to your body. So we don't want to be overreaching to access the items that we use all the time. So that's your keyboard and your mouse. So they need to be positioned directly in front of you, close to the edge of the desk. So there's no overreaching and you can quickly access them. Things that you still use frequently, but don't use all the time. So things like a notepad, a pen, a telephone, things like that, still need to be within arm's reach, but not affecting that primary zone of your essential items. And then your, your other items that um, you just need every now and then. So things like a glass of water, maybe some snacks, um, a mobile phone, things like that need to be um, only in your space when you need them or well out of that zone of your workplace. Um, and in the picture here, we can see um, if you need to refer to a document, um, bringing that up between your key back keyboard and your monitor just when you need it is really good. If you don't have a document holder at home, using some blue tack or some um, sticky tape or, or something like that to prop it up just when you need and then removing it once you don't need is a great way to go. Um, and the final point on there was um, telephone use. So you can see in that picture, you've got a mobile phone there with some headphones. If you can utilize some headphones or a headset or something while you're at home, um, that's gonna be much more ideal than reaching for a telephone over all of your other things um, and utilizing a, a hands-free option. Um, so the, the picture on the right there is a really good demonstration of everything spaced out evenly, your keyboard and your mouse nice and close, um, and your water a little bit further back off to the side. Perfect. All right, Joshy, we've got about five minutes. Do you want to take us quickly through uh, a nice stretching and exercise program to finish this all off? Given that we've all um, most likely been sitting down for about 35, 40 minutes now, um, I will bring you up on the screen and you can take us through a nice little stretching program to finish this off. Beautiful. So some really simple things, I guess, ideally in terms of movement during the day, we would much rather you actually get away from the workstation and, and do it in that way. So whether it is to jump off and quickly do something, grab a glass of water, go for a quick walk outside, whatever it might be, that's much preferred. If we're a little bit strapped for time, starting with things like just some simple movement of the neck. So bringing your ear down to your shoulder, repeating that on each side a few times, nice and gently. Um, things like, you know, rotating the neck, getting some more movement through there. If we move through to, I guess, our upper back, um, a really good one while you're in the chair is actually trying to lean back over the top of the chair and getting some extension through our, through our back. A lot of the time during the day, we're spending a lot of time using these muscles in the front, so it allows us just to get a bit of movement through the back there. We can also, while we're sitting, do some rotation. So rotating to one side, 
and rotating to the other. Um, if we keep moving down the body, um, standing, doing some things just like a few squats. So if you're, you know, having a bit of trouble with those, even grabbing the back of your chair and using that as a bit of a, a steady for you and doing some squats from there. You can also, you know, move into things like a lunge, a backward lunge or something along those lines. And then to get some movement through the lower back area, you could start with trying to again extend back over your belt buckle. Again, all of these nice and gently and slowly um, and even bending forward to touch your toes to get some movement through the lower back area as well. So how, I, how long would you be doing each of those for, Josh? So I guess in, in terms of each of those movements, I'd be looking to, rather than holding them, I'd be trying to move through them gently, um, maybe doing each movement for sort of 15 to 20 seconds just to get some movement through there. Um, obviously for people... Um, you know, you might be managing different things at home as well in terms of injuries or conditions. So in terms of these movements, um, making sure that they're appropriate for you as well. You may have exercises that a physio or a treat has given you, so you may lean to, to doing some of those things in replacement of some of the things we've just gone through. Yeah, perfect. Um, what about outside of work time? Uh, what about physical activity in general? Is there something that we should be favouring, some types of exercise that you recommend? Yeah, look, I'll, I'll jump in there. So I suppose um, making sure that you have a, a routine of physical activity outside of work as well, whether you incorporate that into your work day and maybe do it um, half an hour over your lunch break or at the end of the day. Um, national guidelines suggest that each person aim for 30 minutes of moderate intensity physical activity per day. Now, what does moderate intensity mean? It means that you're going to establish some form of, of puff and puff or a little bit of an increase in your heart rate. So 30 minutes of that per day. Um, it's also beneficial to do some sort of resistance exercise on top of that. And what resistance exercise means is essentially you are putting a little bit of additional work into your muscles than what you would get from a, from a standard work. So resistance exercises can be body weight or, um, you know, using some, some weights or it could be things like yoga, Pilates, um, simple movements like that. So incorporating things like that into your day. Fantastic. All right, let's open up the floor. Um, does anybody on the line have any questions for Josh or Tamsin or I? Uh, if you do, post them in the, the questions area there. Um, we'll get to them as we, we finish up the session. Uh, there's just a few more examples of some stretches that you can use within an office space. Um, as you can see, Josh has demonstrated a few that you can do seated. Obviously, there's Obviously. some ones that you can do standing as well. Um, pick a few of them each hour, try and rotate through them. And, and, and what we're looking for is that you're getting up and getting moving as much as possible throughout the day to try and avoid those those static um, positions. I think it's, sorry, Stuart, I'm just going to jump in really quickly to reiterate a point. I think it's really important to note that um, you could have the best ergonomic setup in the world, it could be 10 out of 10 ergonomic setup. But if you're not also taking responsibility and following recommendations when it comes to stretches throughout the day and taking regular rests from your workstation and postural breaks and doing some physical activity, then your ergonomic setup is only going to get you so far. So to get the maximum benefits out of your ergonomic setup, you also need to do um, follow all of these recommendations in regards to your stretching. So each are um, just as important as each other. And to get the maximum benefits out of one, you have to be responsible and do the other one. Yeah, absolutely. We've had a question come through from Sally who asks, what type of eye exercises should we be doing? Yeah, so I'm happy to take this one, but the main thing in terms of our eyes is that we are 
I guess it feeds back to those breaks almost. In in doing those breaks, our eyes will get a bit of a rest from the screen. Um, generally, what we recommend every 15 minutes or so, trying to just take your eyes off the screen and just avert your gaze and focus on something else in the area that you're in. Um, we'll just give the eyes a bit of a rest during the day. And I know for me, if my eyes get tired and I'm feeling quite fatigued through the eyes, generally I'll really start to feel tired and fatigued. So for me, it's a really important thing that I need to try and do is just to look away and take my my gaze away from the screen during the day. Um, another thing is making sure you've got enough light in the area you're working in as well. Um, if we're relying a lot on the the light coming from our monitors and our screens, that will contribute to eye fatigue as well. So make sure you've got appropriate lighting in your work area so um, I guess the eyes are able to, to not work too hard to focus on those, those monitors and screens as well. Yep. I guess the other thing you could do is just some simple exercises where you're just changing, uh, same sort of thing you said, is just changing where you're looking. So you're looking up, looking down, looking left, looking right, um, and then just opening and closing the eyes a few times. That's a, just that variation in um, variation in where your eyes are looking should be enough. Peter's asked, what about, what is enough light? Is natural light from the windows enough? Um, through most of your day, depending on what it's like outside, it, it should ideally be fairly appropriate. It's probably... If you are noticing that it's a bit of a gloomier day, um, so for me it's um, a bit, it's not, too, it's a little bit cloudy here in Melbourne. So um, I've actually got my overhead light on as well when generally I'll, I'll be working generally with just the natural light. But given today, I've put that extra light on just to give me that additional light um, during the day. So it might be an overhead light, it might be a lamp that you might need to invest in to give you that extra light if it's a darker area of the room. But um, yeah, I guess it, it varies depending on the task that you're needing to complete. Yeah, I guess, I guess like if you're somebody who's doing graphic design work, the level of light that you're going to need is going to be much higher because you are focusing on, on much smaller details on either the screen or on the, the work that you're doing. Uh, whereas if you're just reviewing documents on on the monitor, maybe your natural light plus the screen and overhead light is going to be enough for you. So it is going to be a little a little dependent on your situation. But um, thing, sorry, you go, Samson. I was just going to say on that, yeah, it's it's really dependent on on your individual needs as well. So listen to your body, like your eyes will tell you. Um, I know that. Um, you know, my eyes will get really tired and I'll feel like I have to start blinking and straining to really read something if my light isn't efficient enough and that might be different for what sort of light that Josh needs. So, you know, listen to your eyes. If they're getting tired, if you're feeling like you're having to refocus frequently, then you probably need to change change the lighting um, and you should get, you know, almost immediate relief if you increase the lighting in the room and you feel like there's less stress, then that's obviously more appropriate for you. Fantastic. Uh, it doesn't look like we've got too many other questions coming through. Um, so we might wrap it up there. I think the webinar should close us out in the next couple of minutes or so. So just a final couple of things. Um, make sure that you're being as proactive as possible with your home ergonomic setup. If you're as comfortable as you can be right now, um, make sure it stays that way. So keep reviewing what you're doing. If you notice things um, are starting to change, if you've got a few aches and pains, listen to your body, um, try and make some change nice and early and, and address those issues as soon as you can. Um, workplace behaviours, we probably can't stress that enough, but the, what you're doing within your, your space, um, how you manage your posture, how you manage your work tasks, they're the things that are going to have the biggest impact on your, your comfort throughout the day. Um, and I guess working from home, trying to maintain some sort of structure and routine into your work days is really important. Think about your mental health, stay connected with family and friends because um, that can be all too challenging while, while you're in lockdown, while we're, we're going through all the, the hardship that is um, COVID as well. So keep, keep in contact with people and, and look out for yourself and others as much as possible. Josh and Tamsin, thank you very much for your time today. Um, very appreciated. 
for everybody on the line, thank you for tuning in. Um, greatly appreciate you taking your time out of your day to to sit down with us um, and hopefully you've taken something out of it. Thanks right. for listening, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Stu. No worries. Thanks, guys. Finish it up there.